Begin. Good. Next. Good. Next. Good. But why is it especially dangerous to replace a member of that species? They can breathe water as easily as air, and we can't copy abilities like that. And? And even if there's no water around, almost every elude we meet on land has an invisi- a Kolos cloak to protect them. The Kolos is powered by chemical skin secretions, which changelings can't produce. Correct. Now, as your last test, cast one of his spells. Gingerly, do not seriously harm the dwarf. Excellent. I believe you are ready. Adventurer Jinx. Tales from my RPG campaign, Sea of Secrets. Our adventurers skip town to avoid some official interest by the powerful Illud Republic. During a rest stop, Jinx caught Blue attempting to murder a jerk with his psychic powers. But after a private conversation and seeing how ashamed he was, she chose not to tell the others. Then they were all ambushed by magicating druids. No, they think their own magic is fine. They're against arcane magic. So it turns out, while you guys were crushing the thugs around the broken down cart, these sneaky, sneaky druids had some other stuff going on. First, there are some plants over here. A shambling mound? I should hope not. Well, only level three. Nothing that drastic. More like some kind of minion-y vine plants. I changed my dodge target to the Thalids. Paylor is still dodging the wolf. You can only change your dodge target on your turn. But Blue killed my dodge target. Well, on the plus side, a dead wolf can't hit you, so in a sense, your dodge is now 100% effective against it. You think that force push was overkill? Nah, that tripping shit can be a real pain. So this plant shoots out a barbed tendril at Paylor and misses. The other one is going to tag Misho. It hits uh, touch AC 14 from that far away. These vines have a 15 foot offensive reach, though that doesn't apply to their opportunity attacks. You can still move up to them. It's almost like a ranged touch attack. Okay, well 14 touch definitely hits me, yes. So Uhumisho takes one damage and you have to make a DC 13 fortitude save. Made it? Wait, fortitude? Are these things goddamn poisonous? Maybe. Then, bottom of the round, the lead druid, revealing themselves and their bear behind the ridge, finishes summoning an earth elemental, which moves up to Misho and smashes him for nine with a rocky fist. There is a lot of shit that going on. There he is. You and your arcane abomination won't get away with this. Well, you started it. I think you know who started it. And her bear is going to charge... Jinx. All I did was mend your wheel. My reach weapon gives me an attack of opportunity. Take 11. Ow. Bear's pretty badly hurt already, but his charge still carries it forward to bite Jinx for seven damage. Well, I'm bloodied by the giant bear attack. Actually, where I come from, that's called a small bear. What? Also, because of the weird way summoning spells work, the elemental which just appeared is what the druid spent all of last round casting. Her action for this round is to cast Entangle. Rude. Casting it directly on top of you guys would catch the pets, so instead, she drops the spell more over here, protecting her and her attack plants. Goddamn druids, with their animal companions and their summons and their I do as much as an entire party. It's a good thing she does as much as a whole party, because the rest of her party are all down already. Can't Misho just jump right over that? Probably, though that spell has a huge area. I'll definitely need a running start first. Also, you currently have an elemental next to you? Not for long. Oh, and the cleanser thug. He's supposed to attack at the bottom of the round. Uh, I guess he'll attack Misho too. Um, AC 17? That's a hit, right? Depends. 
Is he evil? Uh, sure. Then he misses. My Lamazu soul meld grants plus two AC versus evil attackers. One of the guys in the cart had managed to resist Adria's color spray spell, and they emerged to club her for five damage. Your putrid magic won't save you! I don't need the magic for fools like you. <clears throat> it just saves time. Misho tears apart the elemental with his two claw attacks, then turns and bites the already wounded bear for eight, killing it and freeing up Paylor to vault over and scythe down one of the dangerous plants. Well, the one with spells worth stealing is way over there across the entangling vines. I guess I'm just gonna stab this guy. Miss. I didn't exactly choose to be this way, but if you got a problem with me, let's see how you like it. See how you like it. Get out of my mind! Ah! She failed her will save. Brain locked! She can't do anything as long as I concentrate, so I can just keep her locked down at the cost of your own turns. So it would be her turn, but now she's dazed. Her bear's gone, her elemental's gone already. That's it? She's paralyzed? As long as Blue spends his standard action every turn to maintain concentration, she can't take actions. This thug will attack Misho. That seems like a bad idea. What choice does he have? At this point, his only possible way out is through you. In other words, there's no way out for him. Hits Misho for five, then the remaining plant attacks you as well, and wait, even as a touch attack, ten is gonna miss you. My regular armor class is pretty good, but with the minus two from raging, my touch AC is only ten. Or twelve if it's evil. If the plant is evil? Maybe there are some kind of sentient plants out there who are evil, but like the vast majority of flora, these vine minions count as neutral. So you do take another one damage and another fortitude save? <laughs> I saved all right. No poison for you then. These guys have no chance with their leader locked. <laughs> I just wish I could get to her. I bet she has some nice spells! <laughs> Dodging around the remaining cleanser <laughs> thug, Misho grabs Jinx in one of his massive hands and <laughs> leaps, carrying her across the magically grasping weeds, <laughs> landing right next to the dazed druid. Imagers. Just throw that one on the pile, Pelor. Although the entangle is still going, the fight is actually over. She's at your mercy as long as Blue keeps her locked down. If I name a specific spell, I can steal it, if they have that spell prepared. If they don't have the one I name, I get a random spell instead. Come on, Cure Light Wounds. Yes, jackpot. I'm back to my full 14. Your max hit points is 14? That's less than half my hit points. Well, remind me to stand behind you next time we're ambushed. Yeah, well, that's the ridiculousness we end up with when you guys all decide to roll random stats instead of point by. And Paylor rolled random hit points after first level. What about the goons in the wagon? They didn't make it. No witnesses. What a shame. Can you store up stolen spells? Only for an hour. And I'm only a level one spell thief, so I can't store more than one spell level at a time. But any healing is useful right away. Does she have another cure light? Yes! Here you go, Misho. Thank you. Jagad pokes his head out, now that the fighting's done. I'm pretty sure this one was not my fault. That's probably true, but we should question at least one of them. The last one. If even these idiots also knew about our expedition, then I might as well give up on secrecy. They were waiting for us. For some reason. Questioning a spellcaster is pretty dangerous. Oh, I can take away all her spells. Since she's defenseless, I don't have to keep dealing damage. Jinx uses her dagger to draw blood from the powerful druid's arm. Then, using her strange art, she begins draining off the helpless halfling's spells, one by one. Any more healing? Nope. I got speak with animals. Hi, dog! Hey, hey, hey! Is Ryder okay? He's not moving. Oh, he's just concentrating really hard. He'll be back to normal soon. Oh, good, good! Jinx tries again, stealing another casting of Entangle, which she also casts, just to make room. But her next attempt 
fails. There! She has no more spells that I can steal. All right. Interrogation time. You guys didn't attack just because she fixed your wheel. This was a planned ambush. Uh. We know you're some kind of cleansers. I get that. But why? Why were you waiting for us? Back at the inn, I saw your blue abomination. And I saw him when he- ah! She she was about to cast a spell. I, I warned you I could only steal minor spells, but I didn't realize- I, I didn't think she must have had a big one left. Oh, nice catch then. Yeah, that was a close one. Any good loot? She has plus one hide armor. So that's a no on the loot then. Hide armor's stats are so bad that even with a small magical bonus, it's not worth wearing, so they pack it up to sell, along with some other mundane gear from the thugs. Are these holy symbols worth anything? Huh. These aren't regular cleanser symbols. They're some kind of variant. A variant? Well, like any group of people, druids, even mage-hating splinter groups, fall along a spectrum. I'm sure most people with cleanser ideology are a normal people living normal lives. Not setting ambushes, attacking you just for mending a cart? Yeah. In any case, cleanser groups are officially banned in talk. I thought we could sell their symbols. We can always sell off their cart, though. Yeah, you'd have to clean up in there first. And uh, finish fixing the wheel. I think we'd uh, best leave it behind. Just take the horses. I have outrageous riding skill. But yeah, we should get out of here. We don't want to have to explain all these bodies to the marshals. Why? They attacked us, we defended ourselves. I don't see the problem. Trust me, right or wrong, it would get... messy. Ugh, I can just imagine it. Getting drawn into a whole legal process would really not help our expedition. Especially if those fish people from the embassy got involved. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. As the party hop back in their own wagon and ride off, Pillor mounts one of the new horses, guiding the second. If he noticed the smoke rising from the broken down wagon where Adria had left the bodies, the mercenary failed to mention it. Their border crossing into Tark was uneventful. The dwarves guarding the checkpoint were about as bored as you'd expect at one of the world's few peaceful land borders. From there, they took the road north toward Corso's chasm. Pelor, you look so glad to cross the border. I'd almost guess you were a wanted man back in Larek. Are you kidding? Everybody wants me. Along the way, they passed several mechanicals working the dry northern fields. Mechs are artificial beings, left behind by the ancient Magitek civilization that used to occupy this area. They come in many forms, but most are human-shaped, crafted to be fully sentient servants or soldiers. From time to time, new mechs are still being discovered, awakening them from suspended animation, but they usually have little memory of the ancient times when they were forged. Wonder what that feels like. Some of them develop strong personalities, set goals, and achieve impressive things, while others find menial labor to be the most natural way of life, or simply don't form much personality at all. Unsurprisingly, people try to take advantage of their lack of knowledge, put them to work for minimal pay since they have few physical needs, not even food. But other Tarkish dons and business dwarves pay glorious, exorbitant wages to recruit and retain such skilled, strong, tireless workers. But who created them? Their creators were called the Atarans. They wielded incredible magic, but went extinct over a thousand years ago, before the Great War. That part's common knowledge. The real question is why hundreds, maybe thousands, of mechs were put into suspended animation then hidden away all over this country to be rediscovered centuries later. Not my problem. As long as I don't have to fight any more of them. Those were tough bastards. About a hundred miles later, they reached Corso's Chasm, a bustling trading and mining town perched on the edge of the Great Plateau overlooking the sands of the crumbling wastes. Hmm. Huh. What? What's wrong? Maybe it's nothing. But when I passed through here months ago, 
there were a fair amount of elves. Makes a sense. This is the main hub for traders coming down the long road from Talaris. The elven lands, northeast of here. Well, Misho's onto something. I'm not seeing many pointy ears here today. Present company accepted. I wonder why. Jinx, what exactly are you doing? Just taking notes in my journal. Notes? That there are fewer elves? Yeah, it seems noteworthy. Are you worried that you'll forget? I mean, no, not really. Well, then why not just use your memory, instead of scribbling little symbols on slices of dead trees? But what if I want to share my observations with somebody else? Then just tell them, or sing it to them. I can't sing all the way to my friend in Tarquajan, but I can just mail him a letter. Hmph, <laughs> I suppose. Alright, since I'm apparently prone to being kidnapped, I'd better take two of you with me, Paylor and, uh, Blue. The rest of you, please pick up any supplies we might be missing, and most importantly, use this credit note to pick up a supply of real dwarven iron rations. May we never have to use them. This settlement, a sort of crossroads, was dominated by a marketplace noisy with traders from Laric and Tark, but also from the elven lands and points further north. Or at least, there used to be elves. A number of stalls were empty, and the few fair folk remaining appeared to be packing up. Excuse me, ma'am? Do you know why there are so few elven merchants in town? We were hoping to find some, uh, authentic hummus. I wouldn't know about the others. Myself, I have simply sold out my goods. It is time for me to head home with these dwarven goods, sell them in turn, and resupply with my fine rope from Talaris. Hmm. <laughs> Sounds reasonable. Traders do move in and out, like the tides. Maybe, but I doubt the elves all sold out at once. We Eldar peoples are not always open to outsiders, depending on the topic. I may have more luck asking around on my own. Adria probably could have asked a wood elf, but she happened to spot another Eladrin like herself. The High Elves, as they called themselves, were much less common in this part of the world, and he greeted her with a friendly bow. Greetings. I have been in the Bankton area for some time. Is there some news I have missed? His eyes widen, then narrow, looking side to side before leaning in. News indeed, and not good. The Yi Jun have renewed their offensive. The ants? How serious? The Queen and Prince have called for any kin who are able to return to Oras, to man the trenches with sword and spell. Talaris has offered aid of a sort. Their king calls for elves to cross over to the Fey to support our economy while we head to the front. Sweat is cheaper than blood, but I suppose we should be grateful nonetheless. My thoughts to the letter. Will you answer the call? I've a room if you need a ride back to the old woods. I'm afraid I cannot return with you. But we are called. Already the gray line grows. And if we do not fight... I wish I could join the trenches. I do. But I have obligations that require me to stay here. And obligations that require me not to return to Oras. Well, I cannot see through your eyes. So I cannot judge. May your burdens lighten with time. May the stars grace you at the trenches. If someday I can return and still have a home to return to, I will give thanks to you and to countless others. Hmm. So, what's up with the elves? No big deal. Just heading back for a festival. Ooh, I don't know much about holidays in Talaris. What's the festival about? Oh, you know elves. Probably trees or something. Hey, I think I found where they sell those special rations Jagad wanted. Across town, Jagad visited the office of one of his transportation contacts. 
Federico. Chekad, I was not sure I'd see you again before your mysterious sea journey. Well, details of my travel arrangements seem to have gotten out. I've been going over my various contacts and conversations in my mind, and I've concluded that the information can only have come from you. Huh? I imagine you were just going about your business. Federico, when suddenly a fish person appears in front of you with that terrible invisibility cloak sound. And they stare into your eyes for a moment, and you think you're about to die, or who knows what. But instead of attacking you or threatening you, they offer you money. And you look at the coins, and you look at all those teeth, and you think it's just information. I'm sorry, Jagat. I just, I just. Oh, cool. We found the right guy on the first try. Huh? Wait, you said... He said you were the leak, Federico. And he was right, wasn't he? Look, I understand. It's just a shipping charter. What's the harm? I might do the same thing in your place. I just want to know who was it. Who wants to know where I am going? I, I don't know. Some elude in a hood. I didn't recognize them. But what did they ask? Who sent them? They said they were from the council. Elude officials all say they represent the council, especially the middle management types. 90% of the time, they're just trying to sound important. What else? I, I don't know anything else. They just asked about Jagad's travel plans. Hmm. Once you take a spy's money, they're never done with you. They must have left you some way to contact them with any new information. Well... Huh. Look at this! This address is way down south. The Horatio Estado. I heard about some kind of disaster down there not long ago. A lot of dwarves died. That sounds familiar. I think the Illud envoy to that area got replaced afterward, but that's a thousand miles south of here. What could they possibly want to do with us? So what do we do with this guy? Do? Nothing. We found out as much as we could. I wouldn't want to ruin our business relationship. Let's go. Thank you for your time, Federico. Eh? Hardest rations in town? You mean the hardiest? No, it definitely says hardest. How much do they cost? Let's see, this cute little keg-shaped container is... 50 gold? 50? 10 hands worth of gold? For that much food? Are you sure you're reading it right? Pretty sure. I know Jagad gave us 100 gold, but we must be able to do better than that. Asking around, Adria found that 50 gold really was the market price for 5 to 6 pounds of alchemical iron rations in a waterproof cask. The famously, or infamously, long-lasting rations, even the dwarves seem to avoid using the word food, were thin desiccated discs or wafers. In their dry state, they were lightweight and near impervious to mold, fungus, and insects but needed to be soaked in water, usually for over an hour, to become edible. Dwarves tell stories of subsisting on decades, or in some cases, centuries old iron rations, as long as they were kept dry. For about the weight of two to three days of normal rations, a person could survive calories and vitamins for two months on a single pack, if you stretch them. I'm sure they do stretch. Sounds like they're made of rubber. I heard one seller, Lorenzo, does have a lower price. We should check him out. <laughs> Lorenzo has the best tasting iron rations in town. <laughs> Nobody was quite sure what to make of that random comment, but they found Lorenzo cursing and scrubbing at graffiti on the side of his booth. Graffiti, which simply read, Tasty. Tasty? <laughs> Preposterous! 
My abuelo perfected this formula before I was born, and if there were a wafer left from that first batch, it would still be good today. And by good, you mean bad? Maybe for iron rations. Tasty is an insult, because it implies they were not made properly. A grave insult! And if I find the pendejo who did this, I will shove a wafer up there. We were sent to buy iron rations, but you understand why, with all the negative rumors, we're a little hesitant to- I know, I know. Those bastards have driven my prices down already. I can haggle no lower. I'm barely making copper as it is. But I keep selling because I know my rations will prove themselves over time. Could we try a small sample then? These alchemical goods were too expensive to give free samples, but Lorenzo agreed to a token deposit and, with a knife and a concerning amount of effort, broke off a small piece for Adria to try. Can I bite into it? Not only can you not bite through it, but you are sure your teeth have made bigger dents? Bite testing gold coins. Normally you'd soak these for about an hour. But a piece this small should be ready in 20 minutes. No heat required. And, of course, you can even use salt water. 20 minutes later. Alright. Now. How is it? <coughs> it is not tasty. Does it taste poisonous? No, no, it's uh, very tough. But the flavor is more like uh, cardboard with a faint hint of bread and magnesium. Sounds a little poisonous. I would not want to live on this for a week. Nobody does, but uh, nobody wants to starve to death either. And when things get desperate, at least surviving on iron rations gives you a tale to tell. Dead men tell none? They bought 50 gold worth of Lorenzo's stock for which he gave them 30% more rations than the other dealers, but spent the other half of the banknote on one of the more traditional vendors, hedging their bets just in case. When the party met up that evening, after selling off the extra horses, they finally enjoyed some real dwarven beer, especially Adria, as she tried to wash away the cardboard taste. The next leg of their journey went smoothly, continuing east through the Hierro woods, past the small heavily mined mountain range the dwarves had dubbed Hills of Hard Work. But finally, after traveling 600 miles from Bankton, they reached the coast and Port Stormsmith, the industrial harbor town on the strait between the blossoming sea and the wider ocean. If anybody needs a new sword or axe, this is the place to buy it. Nah, I'm good. What would I do with a sword? Exactly! Magic is great, but knives and bows are quieter. Right, Jinx? I don't know. I'm not really that sneaky. Coming up on the docks. There it is, down at the end. The ship I chartered for us. The Sea Wing. Shh, get it down. The docks are being watched. This is a major port on a thrashing sea. Wouldn't it be weird not to find a bunch of Illude around? Of course, there should be a few troops under the local envoy, plus customs officials. But then there are those guys. They aren't watching for trouble. They are looking for someone specific. I can tell the difference. Should I stop or keep going? But don't head for the sea wing. But try not to look like you're avoiding it. Just drive casual. Take the next turn away from the docks, and we'll look for an inn where we can stop and figure this out. Are you sure they were the Illude from the Embassy? We skipped the meeting, so we don't even know what they look like. These ones could have been searching for anyone. They could have been hunting for runaway slaves, or... Oh, we don't want to run into real slave hunters. Why do the so-called good countries put up with these slavers anyway? Well, I grew up in Larik. And the Illud's brothers, the Deluvians, who are at war with them, they conquered Verandi and then took Larik's entire coast in the Peace Bond Treaty. Both sides do keep aquatic slaves, but I can tell you, those guys are a lot worse. Unlike these Illud, 
The Diluvians still worship the Baal, goddess of slaughter. It's a miracle they agreed to a peace treaty at all. They agreed because they don't care about us at all. They needed all of their strength to fight their civil war. But if the Illud Republic were to collapse, the Diluvians would have the entire continent surrounded. They could conquer everything. So the Illud are by far the lesser evil. We need their armies. You mean their slave armies? But regardless, Misho is correct. There's no way to be sure those goons were looking for us. But I don't like taking chances. And I take it we don't want their help. Their quote unquote help. I may not know about politics or fish people. Or fish people politics. But I know when somebody's trying to cut in on a deal. Whatever they want with us, I would definitely prefer not to find out. So what do we do? I actually have an idea. First, Jagad needs to approach the sea wing. The ship he chartered? I thought we were avoiding it. They know the name of the ship from their informants, so they'll be watching it. Of course. Hi there, you were the first mate, right? Yeah. I am Jagad. I'm the one who booked passage on your ship a month ago. But I am being followed, so if possible, I need you to look like we are having an argument. Nonsense! I will do no such thing! Ah, fine then. I will take my business elsewhere, sir. Now, as he leaves, Paylor will create a distraction. When we drove by the docks, I spotted an old acquaintance who I think will help us out. Jagad will head to his ship, pay him a few coins up front, then, once we're sure the Illud are watching, Jagad Blue and Misho will board his ship instead of the Sea Wing. Wait, what is the point of the distraction if you wanted them to see where we are going? It seems unwise to make a plan which doesn't account for Paylor's dancing. Yeah, try to keep up. So these Illud will either continue watching and look into when this new ship is planning to leave, or else they'll barge their way on board to confront Jagad. Attention! Please? Hello, I'm Deputy Envoy Frog of the Illud Republic. I have business with the archaeologist Jagad. Where might I find him? He's below decks, unpacking. Thank you for your assistance. What they don't realize is that all the while, the rest of you have actually been loading our gear aboard the first ship, including a big box of Jagad. Believe it or not, I've traveled in worse accommodations. I thought Jagad was on the second ship. And so will those guys. But the Jagad and Misho who boarded will actually be me and Adria in disguise. And while Blue directs them downstairs, we'll be sneaking off disguised as sailors. So the Sea Wing can be underway before those Illud realize that Jagad is missing. But if that's the real Blue, then how does he get back? I don't breathe, remember? I'll just walk along the bottom. Where is he? You, Captain. Where is the human, Jagad? Jawata? I'm uh, sorry, sir, but uh, we don't have any human passengers right now. I can uh, show you the manifest if you like. <sighs> Walking across the bottom is a lot harder than it sounds. Well, you made it. Welcome aboard the Sea Wing. They're finally on the ship, so things are going to get a lot more adventurous. Next time on Tales from My RPG Campaign. Two days later. Why are the birds on fire? These are firehogs. 
I think they're always on fire. They're from the Feywild. I don't care where they're from. That doesn't explain the biology of having a flame in place of a head. This coming from a goblin with psychic powers who doesn't breathe. I still have a head. If they are from the Feywild, then why are they here? It makes no sense. I know a lot about animals, but I still don't understand the fire. Because Feywild. The only answer is Feywild. <laughs>